This week, Moses Hernandez of Cisco Systems joins us again, this time for a full featured interview that's not to be missed. All Mog and Guy from Javelin Networks join us for this week's technical segment, Admin Hunting and Methods of Credential Theft for High Privileged Accounts. Continuing the pwnage against Windows Active Directory because they're just not happy until every Windows admin on the planet has broken down into tears. In the news this week, are you hacked or just paranoid? FedEx suffers a malware <coughs> attack. Jailbreaking is dead. IoT hacking pays. And the most outlandish, opinionated, controversial article we've ever covered on the show. All that and more on this episode of Paul Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security certification training and research. Visit SANS.org to explore their full curriculum and latest training offerings. Gain control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Onapsis is the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Welcome, everyone, to Paul Security Weekly. This is, in fact, episode 520. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. And uh, I just want to announce that uh, Jim Catry has hacked my Facebook account. Uh, and if you haven't heard that story, remind me during our uh, stories of the week when we talk about being paranoid and being hacked and the difference. Uh, remind me to tell you. You ever have a dream that's so real, like you wake up in the real world and do things related to your dream to make sure that it really was a dream? That was me uh, the other night when Jim Carrey uh, hacked my Facebook account. So here well, with me. You might me, as well finish the story now, Paul. So I had a dream that Jim Carrey hacked my Facebook account. Uh, and it was so real that I woke up in the morning and I was really mad at, I'm still mad at Jim Carrey to this day. And it was almost a week ago. <laughs> uh, the attack came as a targeted phishing attack. Um, that's like a targeted spear phishing attack against me from Jim Carrey. I remember that much. I'm still mad that I fell for it, which is weird because. You, you you know him and trust him, so you got an email from him, and you clicked on the attachment. That's right, and he like posted ridiculous messages to my Facebook <laughs> account and sent messages to all my friends. All my security friends were making fun of me because Jim Carrey hacked my Facebook account. I refused to watch another Jim Carrey movie for like a, a while because I'm still <laughs> very upset that Jim Carrey hacked my. That's how real this dream was. Yeah, so you can analyze what that really means. Uh, and so it went with our our story that we're going to talk about later about the difference between being hacked and and just being plain paranoid. Mm. I literally woke up and checked my phone. I was like, "Oh, good, it's just a dream." <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> Apollo Clark is here with me in studio, How's making going? cocktails, talking about all things DevOps, security is an all encompassing umbrella to what we we were on Enterprise Security Weekly. We're going to continue that discussion shortly with uh, Moses. Uh, right after I introduce our next set of hosts and do an announcement, Mr. Jack Daniel is here with us. Jack, Where? welcome. 
where, what, but hello, I'm and back. You're rocking the vintage microphone. Very nice. It's very, very suiting. Suffering hello, bastard. Nice. Hey, suffering bastard. And Mr. Jeff Mann is here with us. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, Paul. Good to see you guys. Good to see you back, Jack. And when we go to Wild West Hackenfest, Jeff Mann will also be presenting. I forgot to hey. mention that. I apologize, Jeff. I forgot that you were you were speaking there. I should have just in, just insinuated that, or just said that you were there because you're doing a lot of speaking this year, and you're going to be there with us, which is going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great time out there. We're going to be in the backwoods of South Dakota at the conference. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Uh, very quickly, IT Pro TV's courses now include Computer Hacking, Forensic Investigator, V9, Kali Linux, CompTIA, A plus 901, and Accelerated CompTIA Security Plus. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual apps and Q&A forums. For a limited time, get 30% off monthly memberships for the lifetime of your active subscription using the code SW30. Please visit our fine friends at ITPro.tv. I would like to reintroduce our very special guest for this evening that we get to sit down and have a fireside chat. We had some fire going before we smoked. You smoked some cocktails. I watched you smoke. We did one with pipe tobacco, which is what I'm drinking mm -hmm. uh, now, which is it's interesting. A I pipe tobacco infused Manhattan. I don't really get the pipe tobacco. We're going to have to infuse it longer next time or mm. something. We're working on it. We're working on it. Work in progress. Also working it, Moses Hernandez. Welcome to Paul's Security. Hey Welcome guys, back. how's it going? Good. Yeah. How are you? It's going good. I'm good. I'm finally moved in, kind of new place. Oh yeah, you moved. That's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. That's good. And actually, now it explains Apollo's uh, <clears throat> like kitchen outfit. I wasn't sure if that was, but I was dressed wrong. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell you this is going to be a show about how to be a, a bartender and stuff. <laughs> Is that what bartenders wear? I've, yes, I've absolutely. Been to a bar that wear if that. you're at a real bar, bartenders <laughs> oh. wear that kind Aprons, of thing. Aprons, like a full-on apron. A yep. full-on apron, yes. Yep. Okay. It gets messy back there behind the stick. It, it's like a it utility does. belt. Yeah. I, I've much. seen Tom Cruise in, what was that movie where he was a bartender? Cocktail. I saw that Cocktail. Movie. Cocktail. Yeah, there we go. He didn't wear an apron. I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. He didn't wear it. <laughs> Don't make me do flair. <laughs> You're admitting that you've seen that movie. That's, that's kind of a strike you against you right there. Mm -hmm. Moses, um, I want to start by asking you, how did you get your start in information security? Uh, um, well, I had this question asked of me a few days ago. So um, my wife says that when I was uh, 13, she knew me when I was a kid, um, I was one of like, two people in a school, in a high school, and I had a computer at home. And um, a buddy of mine and me, we were bored. And so we find, figured out what modems were. And um, we started getting on BBSs back in the 90s. And, um, you know, we I got more involved in the art scene. Um, so like, you know, ANSI, ASCII art, which kind of leads you to like having a board that has frac on it and all these magazines that I really didn't understand. And then that's when um, cyber cyber meant something completely different. Yeah. It meant something different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something you do on the weekends, mm. not for a day job. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, I mean, I have a great BBS. I ran BB, I ran a bulletin board for a while and that was interesting. Um, and then I didn't think that this was a career, right? Cause um, you know, growing up in, in Miami, Immigrant family, um, I, you know, from like the age of like 18 to 20 or maybe like 19, um, I really didn't think I was, this was a career for me. So like I was just screwing around with computers. I mean, I got really into the bulletin board. So I ran uh, my friend, the one that was in uh, bulletin board with me. His brother worked in Boca Raton where I live now, and they were building OS2, hmm. um, 2.1. So um, he gave me a copy of OS 2.1. 2 um, I ran that for a while. Then I ran Linux for a while, like old. Um, sorry, I'm with Larry. Old Slackware. Slackware. Uh, there you go. A, a and disks. Um, but I didn't think this was a career path. And then so um, I was. I I did what my dad did for a while. Uh, my first job out of high school was a machinist uh, at a uh, working on uh, cars. Right. So I did cylinder heads and Borda engines and things like that. Um, and then, um, I wanted to do something else. My mom's like, you know, you really like doing computer stuff. Why don't you go do some 
technical courses and maybe you can build them since you like using your hands or whatever. And I kind of sort of fell into um, building networks and then into security after I realized that, no, it's really a thing. Um, and so I kind of got back into it. But it's funny. I didn't have the path, the career path. I didn't know about it. Um, you know, late eight, late 90s, there really wasn't a career path. And you tell it to kids now and they don't understand that they're given that luxury of like cybersecurity is a career path. You know, like, hey, do you want to go hack stuff? Um, and so the, the reason that I, I bring it up is because a few days ago, one of my daughter's uh, uh, friend's parents asked if uh, if I could talk to the kid about cybersecurity because they knew that's, a, that's what I did. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, this is something that, you know, they're privileged. Kids are privileged today to be able to do this, right? Um, before, you either went to jail or you got hired by a three-letter agency or you were just right place, right time, you know, a technology company or in the Valley or something. Yeah. No, that's it, There's a, an entire program now for high school students called Cyber Patriot, so. Yeah, exactly. That's that's awesome, you know. Um, Better than uh, bulletin boards. <laughs> So uh, you are very involved with web uh, application security. Is that is that correct, Moses? Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, I started off my career as a network engineer, right? And um, you know, like most most network system admin folks, they don't think that you know they think that development or or something other than that. Back in the early two thousands, if you were a network engineer or you were a sysadmin, you didn't necessarily work with web apps, right? Um, and then somewhere early career, I decided that this web app hacking stuff was interesting. And so I had a few years of network engineering under my belt, system administration, and I, I pivoted, um, you know, somewhere like 2007, I kind of pivoted towards web application assessments, app testing, things like that as well. And it took me, I, I tell people, it took me anywhere from five years to, to where I'm at today, right? We're almost a decade to really get my hands or, or a handle on that entire um, uh, discipline, right? So you can make the transition. And a um, couple of years ago, prior to me joining Cisco back in 2012, tw uh, 2011, I like that, um, I took on a job outside of security. So I actually decided that I would take a year off and just, I was burnt out, right? Um, and so I took a year off and I, I did something that I'd never done before. I said, you know, I'm going to be a, a Linux sysadmin, right? Um, just because it sounds fun. And um, I started working for this company, great company. Um, they were building some custom databases and a web app, custom web app, all from the ground up. And I had some experience in previous jobs where we did that. And this company, um, they went, I guess, early DevOps, right? They were. This is like maybe a year after like that scale talk and after people were talking about what DevOps could be and they fully embraced it. So it was a tight team of like maybe 10 of us, 10 to 15 of us, half of us in dev side, half of us in the op side and um, really making this system work and um, stayed there for about a year. Um, probably some of the best experience that you could have. Um, learned but what I, it was like. I bet you, Moses, because uh, my background is somewhat similar to yours, you learned a lot about applications. Yeah. Even when you were the sysadmin, when you're surrounded by developers whose goal it is to make a web-based application, like by osmosis almost, you you just get in tune with that technology. Yeah, so what did I learn? I, I learned a few things. Number one is I learned how to build... Um, I learned the development process from the from the agile Kanban side, right? So there was Kanbans, there was scrums, there was agile. Um, I was on the sysadmin side, even though I helped write tests, mm -hmm. right, for the test framework. Um, I had to learn how to package software prior to um, Docker, right? Mm -hmm. Docker really didn't exist. So um, we used FPM. It was we packaged the software, and what was interesting was this app was um, Groovy. It was written in Groovy. Um, which was a language similar to Ruby that was uh, acquired by VMware many hmm. years ago. And it ran on the JVM. And, you know, if you've ever taken a class with me and you make fun of my Emacs, right? Um, you know, the JVM on the server side is a really good, highly efficient uh, machine, right? I mean, it's got its warts and we break it and, and I get all that. But there is some beauty in the JVM. And there is a reason why a lot of uh, mature enterprises run Java today, 
So well, yeah, I, I don't Java. Wanna... Java. I won't disagree with you that Java on the server side. It's funny in the uh, early two thousands, I worked at a, a dot com startup when there was such a thing. Uh, and the app was all built. Some of it was built on client side Java, but there was also server side Java as well. It was the server side that really got the developers uh, excited. So yeah, we were, we're we're pretty similar in background in that respect. I was the sysadmin yeah. for for that group. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I uh, I used to make fun of Java, right? Every time that you kind of heard me talk about Java, but until you run it on the server side in production mm -hmm. and you do it for many lengths of time, like years where you're like, dude, that app, we just keep running it and beating it up and it just keeps running. Mm -hmm. um, you don't appreciate it, right? Just the way it is. Mm. And, and the architecture, even with modern languages today, isn't all that dissimilar. I mean, we were talking about Flask, we were talking about PHP, mm -hmm. and there's still web server, app server, database, and just code that's running on top of that. So the fundamental architecture is still the same. Yep. It, it, it is and it isn't, right? So one of the... I think one of the most interesting things that's happened in the last two years, right? If you're if you're really into stuff like I am, um, go to the ThoughtWorks website and go download their technology radar and figure out what they suggest their clients adopt, right? And what's really interesting is this concept of a microservice, right? We make fun of it because you know whatever. It's it's hilarious to talk about this stuff, but if you really consider the way that software is built, especially in a gigantic web app. Um, it's all monolithic, right? It's one big Rails app or one big PHP app, right? And maintaining that software is a is a pain, um, especially if you say, well, I want this particular process to be faster. I want this particular process to go to maybe uh, be optimized, right? And so what ends up happening is you have this um, uh, new concept of a microservice architecture where now instead of having one gigantic app written, say, in Ruby, right? Um, if you want to have a piece of that app written in one language and then have it call another component in that application that's written in a different language, um, not only is it maybe more maintainable, but it's reusable, right? So as an example, <clears throat> let's say that you have a, I don't know, an XML to PDF converter, whatever, or JSON to PDF converter, and you decide to write it for all your applications and you have to write it maybe 10 times or 20 times, depending on the number of apps you have, right? Now you can write it once, call it from in your enterprise from different apps, and when you want to maintain it, if you have like a security bug or something else, you're just fiddling with this one microservice instead of having to mess with the entire app stack. And I think that that's kind of exciting if people understand what it is exactly that people are talking about with microservices. Yeah, so, it goes back to our, our previous conversations. About containers well. and Docker. Yeah, it definitely yeah. validates ah. everything we were just talking about, Moses. So thank you for uh, that. What was that uh, website you mentioned? Thought what? ThoughtWorks. Uh, ThoughtWorks. ThoughtWorks. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're yeah. amazing. Yeah, awesome. they really are. Yeah, they really are. Um, so when did you start uh, transitioning into the security aspect of it all? Um, God. So my first job as a network engineer... Um, you know, I was uh, working, it's like early 2000s, right? And this hospital is where I kind of cut my teeth on engineering. Um, so I went from this environment that was mainframe, which is what they had, into a client server environment. And they were early on on the internet. They were on the internet in like the late, middle 90s, right? So there was no NAT, as an example. Mm. There was no concept of NAT. Um, and they had decided that back in the 90s, they decided that they would have firewalls. And me being a junior network engineer, nobody wanted to touch these things. Mm -hmm. So there were, the first time I, got, I, I saw the console, it was basically checkpoint running on Windows NT, like 351 or Ooh. something. Weird. Yeah, it was crazy. Oh, and, see, I, I got lucky. <laughs> I pulled the checkpoint running on Solaris card rather than Windows NT. Well, we, we converted to Solaris, yep, right? Because I, I had a background in uh, Unix. So we mm -hmm. converted to Solaris and then after that, like a little while after that, they decided that they wanted more horsepower. So we ran um, Nokia Ipso. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Nokia. <laughs> dude, we Nokia. had like we're like in parallel universes, dude. Did I had the run, same did, thing. <laughs> did you run? Um, did you run uh, Real Secure? ISS Real Secure. That was the IDS we ran. Uh, I played I around so with that back so. in the day. Yep. 
Yes. No, nobody really ran IDS real secure. No. Well, it, Net, 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 Ranger, Net Ranger was a thing from that Cisco <laughs> bought as well. Jack and Jeff know we figured this stuff out with Multics a long time ago. That's right. I don't know why you young guys had to change <laughs> everything. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you for watching uh, History of Security Weekly. Now we can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> well, because then, well, then you look into IDS back then, and you're obviously looking into Snort, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, so when we were looking at IDS, when did Maybe Snort really Dragon. 2001? Maybe Dragon, yep. I evaluated Dragon, certainly. Uh, Gauntlet? Yeah. Um, no, I never Gauntlet. I, didn't, I never oh, touched Gauntlet. Gauntlet's a firewall. Firewall, yeah, it's firewall. Uh, the next refresh cycle that we went through, though, um, I went from one hospital to another. The next refresh cycle, it really wasn't about IDS anymore. It was um, we were looking at that point at tipping point in 2002, and um, EI, which is kind of a blast mm -hmm. from the past. So Mark Mayfrey and EI yeah. decided to come over and said, "Hey, we've got some new technology to show you," and it was their Blink I, uh, Hips product, mm -hmm. um, which was a really, uh, for its time, that product was pretty stellar. Um, I used it for a few years, and I really liked that product, actually. Nice. Yeah. It's, so it's then, quite the stroll down memory lane. Absolutely. That's so right, then where, yeah. did, where did you go after that, uh, Moses? It, like, Because today you're very involved with the advanced web app pen testing, so I'm assuming you've done a lot of web app pen testing stuff. Yeah. So my first real security engineering job, um, um, where I wasn't a network engineer or sysadmin, I was just a pure security engineer job, was at a startup, right? So I... I it was all at once. It was a startup. It was wear every hat and just focus on security. And at the time, you know, it was a um, it was a company that had that that had a web service. Uh, it was a pretty interesting company. They built their own databases. They had a web service with APIs that you could call. They had just been starting to build their web front end. And not only did I have to be the security person on the network side, which wasn't really a big network. It was pretty easy. It was like you know, a couple people. Uh, but then I had to start looking at their web app, which was every single language you could think of, right? Mm -hmm. The database was written in C, the, the web front end was written in PHP, there was some Perl code, which you never want to do that ever again. Uh, mm -hmm. There was all this stuff going on, and um, they were actually a pretty uh, big target um, because of the data that they had. Uh, we won't kind of go in there, but they were a pretty big target. And so um, we would see attacks on their front end uh, website quite often. And every time that they would release code, um, there would always be a struggle to figure out what, what new thing did they introduce? What did they break? Um, what, uh, what was wrong with their PHP stack? Things like that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so certainly you had your share of vulnerabilities to pull from with PHP. Uh, yeah, well, and it's funny. We... Um, we implemented things back in 2010 that people, you know, they really take for granted now. Like we had to build. So back in 2020, back in 2010, we were talking to people like Johannes and talking about, well, how do we secure a web app? And one of the things we did back then was we built a service. Was it a microservice? But I guess today it could be called a microservice in which um, when you put in your username and password, we would send an SMS code that was randomly generated with six characters. Hmm. And um, now people, we see people doing that now and we're like, hey, that's, we could have just used Google Authenticator, right? Hmm. Um, but what I learned from that was, you know, we, so we were doing interesting things, right? Cause it was a startup. We did the six character code thing, which I fought tooth and nail to get in. Um, we did the, um, you know, we had to do the salted uh, database passwords mm -hmm. back then, which people didn't do much. And then we did GOIP lookups. Right. And the, <clears throat> the weirdest thing with GOIP lookups was we had one class of, of, a, of a customer that we always had trouble with, and that was satellite. Um, so oh, anybody that's thinking okay. of doing – Yeah. So it turns out that GOIP of satellite turns out to be unknown. Uh, so you're doing a lot of exceptions for things like DirecTV, HughesNet, et cetera. So, so uh, when we talk about PHP today, Moses, I think it's a great segue uh, into modern PHP apps. Uh, I've noticed a lot, even in the past couple of years, uh, things have gotten more resilient. We poke fun at WordPress. We poke fun at PHP. But I think things have gotten a lot better. What's your current recommend recommendations for securing PHP applications today? Uh, yeah, you can't really secure PHP application. No, <laughs> I, um, so, so here's, here's the reality of it, right? We've written a lot of code. 
Um, and so that code, I mean, hell, we still have people running COBOL, right? Mm. Um, so I so actually worked on a COBOL project one time, hmm. about yeah, three years ago. Yeah, there you go. So, I, and you can get paid a lot actually writing yeah. COBOL. We wrote a Python wrapper around it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good Lord. you know, you know, you could. Anyway. So, um, there's a lot of software out there that's going to be existing, and in, especially in emerging markets, you're going to still see a lot of uh, PHP. So, even if you try to modernize it all, you're still going to see a lot of um, legacy PHP still out there. It's not like that software is going to go away. Um, have you used I, PHP 7.1 yet? Yeah, I have. So. Yeah. I'm curious about your perspective, given a bit of a Java background. To me, basically PHP 5.6 and going forward feels a ton like Java. Hmm. You know, you're starting to see a lot more packages, a lot more namespaces. Uh, you're starting to get a lot more type checking and type safety. Oh, interesting. That's yep. interesting. Is that yeah. within in 7.1? Well, so, okay, so look. I mean, PHP <laughs> has some architectural problems, right? So, yeah. number one... Um, the way that PHP objects work and uh, the way that they do – the objects are global, mm -hmm. right? So the reason that PHP object injection and deserialization still is a problem is because uh, PHP treats everything as a flat kind of namespace environment, right? So um, when you're running a big PHP app, if you can do something like deserialize an object, right, which is the process of you taking something that's in a binary format – and and maintaining its its uh, structure, right? It's a pretty common thing. If you can, and, and you'll see a lot of these vulnerabilities still out there, right? This is what all these um, PHP object serialization vulnerabilities are about, right? You can deserialize this PHP object, and you can overwrite, right? Um, in in the memory of the application, you can overwrite um, properties, right? Uh, so it's PHP almost like it's almost like memory injection is for an operating system. Is that kind of like uh, deserialization for a, an application? So, all right. So, so I guess um, we got to deconstruct two things, right? One is deserialization. The other one is the way that PHP keeps treats objects, mm, right? Okay. So, so deserialization is just a or serialization and deserialization mm. is the concept that you take a structure, right, and you persist its its integrity, right? So, um, think of reading packets off the wire, right? So if you want to keep a PCAP in its format and not convert it into text or base64 or some other format, you can serialize that object and then store it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Store it in a file, store it on put it on the wire, right? So um, you'll see a lot of network-based services or network sockets using serialization, right? So Node.js has it, Java has it, every every language has mm. a serialization uh, function, right? Um, which is which is okay. The, the danger is when you take serialized objects in from a user without trusting it, right? Without act, with just blindly trusting it, mm -hmm. saying, "Okay, well, I'm going to blindly trust whatever you're going to send me in this serialized uh, format, and then I'm going to look at it, right, and deserialize it." Um, so a lot of these. Um, so what happens is you deserialize it, and in PHP, the developers of PHP decided that when you deserialize an object, it was there would be these methods that you could call, right? So certain methods wake up an object, certain methods destroy an object, right? So you deserialize an object, and then PHP has to destroy the contents of that object to take in the next job. Well, when you, when you call destroy, um, PHP then will also call wake up, right? And when you call wake up, you can now um, build your own, you can now actually be in the stream of objects, okay? Um, so if you know the structure of an application and you know where other objects are, oh, then you can then override the properties. So that's the other thing about mm -hmm. PHP that's weird is that they don't have object-oriented programming, right? It doesn't, it's not a thing no, for it's people, not a thing. really. Yep, in PHP. Right. So, they have namespace, kind of like namespaces. Mm -hmm. They have classes and properties, mm -hmm. and then methods, right? So you have public <laughs> methods. Classes, and classes, methods, and properties, but not objects. Yep. Classes, methods, and projects. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but the, the crazy thing is that you can then take this, you can take a property, and then you can overwrite whatever it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's if you look at any of the the, the bugs that existed in the last uh, few years around PHP object deserialization, um, they're they're pretty basic, right? Like the the Joomla one is probably the most epic one, mm -hmm. where you um, where basically what Joomla did is they took the user agent string, 
because you know you want to do analytics mm -hmm. right to show like people hey i've got a nice console right and i have like this many android apps this many iphone users whatever um they took this cookie value they took their user agent string all this and they shoved it in, a, in an object and they serialized it in a database right um and so it's sitting there in its, in its database as a um serialized blob right and so what happens is um when you go to call it it's got to pull that out of the database and then show it to you on the screen there was an issue with the way that the Joomla developers decided to persist things in the database, okay? So they wanted to take a shortcut, and they actually wrote a function that allowed you to um, shortcut function names inside of the application so that you could, like, fast, you know, you could actually talk faster or type faster, uh, whatever you're trying to program in Joomla. Um, and so because you were taking an untrusted um, data, right? A user agent string from your browser is not really. Mm -hmm. It's just so, data. It's data from the user, right? Yeah, exactly. So you can just take that. So what people did, what they were doing was they took that and then they monkey, they they injected a extension into the database um, driver that Joomla had created for this shortcut, and from there they were then able to look at the Joomla source code and figure out where in the Joomla source code could they then extend their attack, uh, providing that you could you know, uh, write files to the disk or whatever, what, what have you. And they were able to do that, right? So, um, so they were able to, to call other Joomla functions from a user agent yes. string based on the way it was essentially being parsed by the PHP yes. engine, right? I mean, because deserialization is essentially parsing on unstructured data that you're getting from the user. Hmm. A structured data. Structured yeah. data from the user, yeah. Structured data, that's mm. right. Um, you know, I, I know the PHP folks will tell you, don't do this, right? They actually tell mm -hmm. you that the way you should do this is you use JSON and then you base64 encode and decode things, and that should be good enough. Yeah, so um, what, is, is, <laughs> what is, what is really geeky? What is the difference between uh, encoding and decoding in serialization and deserialization? Um, I, technically, you can maintain. Um, uh, structure a little better in um, in serialized objects. So, for example, okay. let's say that you wanted to take a PCAP, right, which is a hexadecimal mm -hmm. binary blob, right? It would be much easier for you to serialize the PCAP and then stick it on a on a file system somewhere than it would be for you to take that base64 encode it, then base64 decode it, put it back in its structure, that whole thing. I gotcha. Okay. You got some extra steps. Oh yeah, if you want to do this in Python, look up pickle. Pickle. Yeah, well, Python there's pickle. pickle. Yeah, there's yeah. pickle. Same thing. Yeah. Yes, I don't. Yeah. I'll look there, into. I look into pickling my Python after the show. <laughs> certainly. Wait. Yeah, no, Python pickle. Python pickle. Python That's pickle. So Moses, I'm sure you've seen with some of these deserialization bugs, you're seeing things like um, you know overloading function names, uh, calling existing function names given the namespace, uh, passing in uh, null values, etc. Well, well, I mean, you also have auto load, right? So the other yep. thing that's crazy is that in PHP. So, so the new thing in PHP, I guess, like in every language, is frameworks, right? So you have Cake PHP and Laravel and all these different things. And um, mo modern software, like Python people would understand this, right? Mo modern software is not necessarily written as much as it's assembled, right? So you take this library. Mm -hmm. It's component-based. Yeah, you take all these libraries, you glue them together, and you're it's like, like Legos. I've got software. Yeah. I knew there was no new code being written. Pretty much. Right. Pretty much. You're <laughs> correct, Jeff. Absolutely. No, absolutely not, right? So... Um, in PHP, to make this easier, they have this thing now called autoload. And so what happens is that any library um, that you will put in a directory could be autoloaded by the framework. So not only do you have PHP object serialization inside of the source code, but if you find it in a library that's, that's used a lot and that library gets put into a directory, then it becomes part of the application dynamically. So you don't have to require any more PHP files to move those um, libraries in. You can just use autoload, and it automatically loads all those libraries. Um, because, you know, PHP is not dangerous enough. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, you, that, do you get namespace this, collision on functions? Is that what you were saying, Apollo? Yeah, so yeah. Moses, I get Moses knows more about this than I do. Um, is with PHP, you can overload. You can do the same thing in JavaScript. So you have a function called foo. Mm -hmm. Well, you can redeclare that function foo with whatever your proprietary code is. I gotcha. 
Well, and, and that's what the object injection is, right? You're yeah. taking um, a public function, like let's say file writer, and let's say file writer is supposed to write a file to a particular part of the disk, right? So file writer equals C temp, whatever. Um, what your injection could do is overwrite that C temp to whatever you want. You are now in control of the file writer object or property. Right. Um, so that's what object injection is. Interesting. But now Java's also suffered from deserialization bugs um, as well. Yes, but but the Java one is different because and actually more interesting because Java actually went through the trouble of creating a security manager, right? Mm -hmm. So they built security into Java, believe it or not. So what's actually happening with I refuse the Java to believe that. <laughs> but what, <laughs> but it, yeah, but hold on. Isn't the JBoss one of the JBoss vulnerabilities a deserialization bug in yeah, JBoss? Yeah, yeah, there is, right? Mm. So what's happening there is instead of you taking this flat object space, what they're doing is you're deserializing it, which is great. Um, you've got the same concept, right, that you, we just talked about. But in Java, you now have this concept of a class and then a superclass. Right. Yeah, and I remember that. Yeah, and technically, you're not supposed to be able to call blacklisted classes, right? So, like system where you can run commands is blacklisted, mm -hmm. right? Or should be blacklisted, so you can't necessarily call it. But if you look at a lot of the deserialization um, exploits, what you're doing is you're calling a class, like I don't know, math, as an example, right? So Java Lang Math, mm -hmm. and then you once the the math class is loaded, um, using something called Java Reflection. You can actually go back upwards and call system again because it's been loaded because system inherits from, or because math okay. inherits from. Ah, it takes me all the way back to my Java class in, in yeah, college. Yeah. All right, yeah. Sorry. My brain hurts now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's great. It was a great. A really you know, you know what the real problem is, guys. It's these damn Turing machines. <laughs> we just got to get rid of these damn Turing machines. <laughs> Yeah, what is it that I've heard lately that everybody keeps saying? The future doesn't repeat, but it sure does rhyme. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what, you said you were building in some uh, new attack techniques uh, techniques into it, uh, the advanced web app pen testing. You mentioned we talked about in-depth uh, serialization, deserialization, which was awesome. Thank you for that. I learned a ton. Um, what, what other kinds of interesting attacks? Yeah, so, so a lot of the... Um, there's a lot of unearthed surface now that I think people are kind of missing the boat on, right? So, you know, ten year, five years ago, right, we would talk about things like, hey, you can call a page without authentication, right? Well, frameworks took care of that. So that's really not a, a common or as common attack or shouldn't be, right? We know how to deal with that. So what except is really on IoT, but that's a different story. Right, except on IoT and well, all largely because frameworks aren't largely implemented on IoT. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and by the way, um, IoT has its own set of problems because the CPUs might not be able to take the right. the computational power of loading a framework. Yeah. So, yep. Other issue. But um, the other attack. So client side is a big thing, right? Now we see a lot more encryption. Um, so one of the things that we were looking at adding that didn't make it to this build, but it's something that's on the roadmap, is using things like Firebug to debug client-side JavaScript. Um, because what's happening is you're dealing a lot with now um, things like Webpack, which takes a lot of um, client-side JavaScript frameworks and compresses them. So you got to deal with that, mm -hmm. um, and it minifies them. So how do you how do you deal with minification? Um, there's also things like there's very heavily used JavaScript frameworks. Um, there's even things now, uh, this is a new one for me. This one kind of threw me for a loop. It's called isomorphic JavaScript. Have you, have you heard of this one? I have not. Well, mm -mm. I've, I've heard of react.js. Yeah, react, and, angular, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've heard well, of angular, yes. So specifically react, right? So, yep. so I, I went to learn React uh, about a year ago. And so I, I went to Ruby on Rails uh, GitHub example site, which is how I learn quickly, right? I kind of go through some example code and kind of grok it, right? So I went to this like React JS Ruby on Rails thing. So I ran it and I noticed that I'm running two sockets. I'm running port 3000, which is Ruby on Rails WebRick. Great, mm -hmm. got that. And then I'm running port 5000, running Node.js. And I'm like, what the heck is this? So what, what the heck is 
React JS then, and why is it running a socket and the whole thing? So what's happening here is Facebook, and you can see how their thinking goes, right? Um, Facebook decided that hooking a bunch of JavaScript client side on a mobile phone, probably not the most efficient for battery or data, right? So we were just talking about how much JavaScript Facebook uh, can load when you call some of their uh, like uh, web two megabytes for a like button. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, what are they? What is this React JS thing that they're that they're pushing now? So, the Rails app boots up, right? It, you go to call a page. Rails does its Ruby thing, right? Where it does a whole, you know, it returns a page with JavaScript, right? Coffee script or whatever, and then it sends it to the Node JS server. So, what the hell is the Node JS server doing? Well, what React is doing, what React is doing is it's rendering the DOM, right, server-side, and then returning HTML to the phone, yeah. right? <laughs> so so it's, like a, it's like a reverse proxy for JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's crazy because, you know, what attack surface is that and who the heck is going to test it? And mm. so there's all these bugs that I think are basically being unearthed that are new and... Right now, I think that's why you're seeing the consternation in the industry around like the new OWASP guide, where people or new OWASP top ten, where they're talking about APIs and, mm -hmm. and uh, self-defending applications or whatever. Um, it's because there's a whole set of bug classes that in the last three years has kind of, I think, taken over. We just haven't caught up yet. Now, speaking of APIs and such, um, they become so popular uh, managing your OAuth tokens and credentials. Are there newer attacks that you found or just, I mean, in general, I think there's abuses. I mean, we saw the whole basically social engineering attack that was based on, on OAuth, but I've found mm -hmm. managing modern applications today, it's, only, it's like a credential management nightmare because I've got all these OAuth tokens everywhere. Yeah, OAuth is, um, OAuth is a beast, right? So you have people like Twitter, that has maintained their OAuth 1 um, environment, probably because it's tested and they, they know how to use it, but um, that has its own set of challenges because OAuth 1 never expires, right? So one time in class, I know I'm a Twitter user for like, what, nine years now, right? So one time in class, maybe a year ago, we were talking about OAuth, and I decided to show the students all the OAuth tokens that are in my Twitter account, and there was probably like 500 Right, mm. and I'm like, well, this is a little embarrassing, but I should probably clean these up. Well, which ones do I use? I don't, I don't even know. Mm. So, we have that. We have then um, the OAuth two thing, where one of the craziest things that I think people haven't even realized is you set up your OAuth one or OAuth two with a web app, one of these new um, Silicon Valley startup web apps, and then that web app disappears. Right. Mm -hmm. So now you've got an orphaned OAuth token, right? But you also potentially have maybe or orphan servers, right? So did that startup erase things correctly? Did mm -hmm. they leave things dangling? Are my OAuth tokens in other places? Um, and th there are a bunch of these OAuth bugs that, yes, there are vulnerabilities. I mean, we just saw one. Uh, there was a great bug bounty um, uh, award from Airbnb around um, the way that they did OAuth 2 and the way that they actually used a seldom used Airbnb site mm. to actually gain credentials, right? Or gain access, right? That's interesting. Um, yeah, uh, so how, how persistent are all the, isn't there the concept of refreshing the token though? OAuth 2. Yeah, that's OAuth 2, right? You have to refresh right. the token, yes. but that obviously yeah. causes issues in your application. Uh, you have to, you'll, you'll see in some web apps, they do this correctly. You'll see it say that, hey, in about 30 uh, days or so from now, your OAuth credentials are going to be revoked. Click here to refresh. Yes. Right? Yeah. Which is, which is great, which that solves that, that problem. Uh, the, the issue is how many people have actually migrated to OAuth 2. And as an example, right, Twitter, which is arguably one of the, the bigger uh, ones out there, they're still running OAuth 1. And right, I don't, yeah, because I don't ever have to refresh my Twitter OAuth <laughs> credentials. Yeah. 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 And I, I, you know, I would actually prefer maybe sometimes to use Twitter um, for some apps than Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Because maybe Facebook is a little personal, or I, I don't know. No, I agree. No, I agree. Yeah. No, that's that's really cool. Um, yeah. Apollo, questions for for Moses on modern. I gotta say that, again, this is my this is my area, so I have way too many. Um, I don't know. I just feel really uncomfortable running JavaScript on the server side. 
<laughs> frankly. Yeah. <laughs> that I was mean, well, Moses pr- presented the last time I was on the show a tech segment on yeah. how the server side JavaScript ends up on the client and you end up running it on the client. Yeah. So, Moses, again, we covered that last time, but. Sorry, I missed that segment. That's okay. Um, step in, interrupt me, please. Um, JavaScript is a great language because it's really quick and easy to learn, uh, really loosely typed. It's all, um, was it object oriented, right? It's not, it's uh, prototypical. So everything's yeah. a prototype, mm-hmm. and everything inherits from the prototype, and you can basically do whatever you want. You can overload things, override things. It makes it really flexible. doesn't throw very many errors. very resilient, so it's quick and easy to learn. And that's really nice for junior developers. You can write code really quick and easy. But unfortunately, when you write things at scale, which I have, I've written apps that included like literally ha- half a million lines of JavaScript. Wow. It was insane. I think the total was like 25 megabytes for a client side. It was an AngularJS app. Um, so I've seen AngularJS at scale. Um, you know, it, it hides a lot of errors. There were times where we'd write errors in the code and it took us days to debug it just because of how kind of forgiving a language mm. JavaScript was. And, you know, just because of that kind of flexibility, it's great client side because most browsers nowadays have a pretty good sandbox around that. They say, yeah, you can do some crazy stuff, but it's pretty well self-contained. You can't go ahead and, you know, it used to be back in the day with IE, uh, six and everything. You could oh, you can open files, you can open up network connections, etc. You know nowadays the sandboxes and Chrome and Firefox are pretty well done, um, and I just think of that in terms of on the server side. There's just such a higher potential for damage, uh, just given the flexibility and kind of openness of JavaScript as a language. Um, what do you think of that? No, it's all good. You don't have to worry about it. It's fine. It's secure. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, it's a great language. I would say it's a great uh, language in certain uh, contexts. But well, client, no, I, server I think side? It, it has to be flexible in order uh, no, to run I, in all the different browsers, right? I mean, that's no, I think is part of the reason why they built that flexibility. Yeah, in. but server side, that's a whole other context. It is. It was never designed for that. So it's like you're just shoehorning this language into a context it was never made no, for. Well, so, so, so first of all, like, okay, so <laughs> JavaScript, where do I start? Um, <laughs> server so side, all, let's talk about <laughs> server side JavaScript. Good, server good and side bad. Java, well, but, so server side JavaScript was part of the language from the beginning. Right? Really? Nobody ever used it. Really? I didn't for, know that. And, yeah. yeah. It really took off after Google's V8 engine and after um, there was a book called JavaScript, The Good Parts, and that's where people really started to take notice of the language. And the promise was, hey, you're having to write JavaScript client side, so why don't you just do it server side? So, Interesting. you know, Node.js no runs on top of V8. And, and anyway, so... The, the thing about the language, right? Um, there's I've been using of... it since 2000. That's my context. Yeah. So, and back in the day, right. yeah. JavaScript well, 2000 was you could do math and like a couple little animations. Well, right? So even math in, in, uh, in JavaScript up until very recently was horrible, right? Oh, you couldn't terrible. do like floats, correct? I mean, they still have issues with like floats and longs and, and all these like math primitives, right? Um, the language was great, but let's not make... Um, Let's not make any bones about it. It was written in two weeks, right? I yeah. mean, that's that's when JavaScript was written, two weeks. So it's a very simple language. Um, you, you, There are people that are working on uh, compilers of JavaScript, right? And so I think I heard one the other day, it was called Elm, where it basically compiles into JavaScript, but because it compiles, it actually gives you all the errors, um, which is kind of nice um, for client-side JavaScript. Um, but, uh, I mean... JavaScript is eating the world, right? So whether we like it or not, I think it's something that we're going to have to just get comfortable with it and use it, right? I, I mean, think that's it's a the, very easily adopted language. Yeah, yeah. I, it's very simple, and it, it's just you can do some horrible things with it. And um, and now, by the way, you're kind of like PHP and Perl. I'd put it in that category. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it is. Well, worse, because um, now they have WebAssembly, which we talked about the last time, right? So That scares me. Writing assembly gonna, for the browser? Yeah. yeah. No. So you're going to be able to write an assembly in the browser, right? Um, so that's going to be fun. Um, and, and it's interesting, right? So, you know, I work at – it's funny. I'm, I'm the web app guy, right? But I, I work at Cisco, and we kind of – you know, we're seeing this stuff. And it's interesting to see how much of the basic networking technology that we're all comfortable with is moving towards web-based technologies, um, and just the whole world getting eaten by JavaScript, right? It's in your, it's in your desktop. It's running um, inside of messaging applications, and it's a very loosely tight, very unforgiving language. Like this, just just this year, I think, or maybe it's about to get released. 
they're about to have the concept of a of a class, right? Yeah, where, was it ECMA two, right? Uh, so like now, like today, right? If you look at it, it's it's ES uh, twenty sixteen or something, as or maybe twenty seventeen is when they're going to do it. Um, but it's funny because like we're talking about something uh, last time called an IIFE, right? I had to look this up. It's an uh, immediately invoked function, right? So basically. Like you call an, un an anonymous function, so function no name, right? And then when you want to call the no name function, you just put the two parens and it runs, right? And I was like, why on God's earth would you want to do this, right? So I looked it up. The reason you want to do this is because you can, like, like Apollo said, right? You can override names, function names, right? So in order to make sure that your code doesn't stomp on somebody else's code, don't give it a name, right? And you can have. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're just going to not give it a name. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a very JavaScript thing to do. I've just been, yeah. I, that is the, the second time this month that I've been horrified by some programming. Everyone just needs to stop and go read Microsoft Press Code Complete and just get back to basics and write good code. Good yeah, Lord. Believe, believe it or not, um, Probably the most sane language right now, and this is going to sound, I, I'm not a Microsoft guy. I don't have Visual Studio. I don't do anything in those languages. But like C Sharp is starting to look like a really sane language, you know? Yeah, I've heard the compared same. To, <laughs> compared to everything else we built, you know, that's the way it is. Interesting. Yeah, the other one was in Nginx where you can't have a conditional not or a conditional and. That's interesting because you have to basically test for a, a variable, and if that condition is true, you set a variable to a value, and then you test the other condition, and if that's true, you take your value from your first condition and you append it to your second condition. Then you have a third conditional statement that tests if that uh, variable has both of those parts from the oh, previous okay. if statements, yeah, yeah, yeah. and if that's, if that's true, that's how you had, I was like, what? I'm like, that is, I am not putting that in production. It's wait, very it, similar to a, like a function not having a name. So wait, this is a web server you're talking about. Nginx. Right? Inside of <laughs> N, yeah, inside of Nginx. Yes, you can actually do you can do limited conditions, but one of the limitations is there's no conditional not or condi well, or a multi-conditional if statement with with an and. This is this is Nginx we're talking about, right? This is a web server. But as Apollo very quickly pointed out, he's like they're doing that for uh, performance reasons. That's what right? I think. You, you take a, I think you're, you're right. You take a performance hit for doing the not. Yeah, I think yeah. they're doing it for performance. That's my guess. Is, yeah. Isn't it safe to say that most of all of this is being done for performance reasons? Pretty pretty much. I think a lot of it. You're right, Jeff. Is is very much performance driven, which I think is a great summary for this segment. <laughs> Greatly impacts. <laughs> Security, right? There's the inverse. Yep. <laughs> what increases performance decreases uh, security. So, yep. yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Noodle on that. While we take a break, Moses, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show. When's yeah. the next time you're teaching a SANS class so people can spend uh, an entire six days with you, which would I be should, awesome. I should, I should know this. Let's see. Um, August. Uh, I'm teaching in uh, Virginia Beach. Awesome. 2017. So. Oh, wow. Awesome. Moses, thank you so much for coming back on Paul Security Weekly. I oh, learned a lot from welcome. this segment. It was fantastic. Thank you so Me much. Me too. That was great. Yeah. Thank yeah you. You're welcome. We'll take a short break. Come back. Bring in our friends from Javelin Networks to make some Windows admins cry. We'll be right back. <laughs> 